Now let's resume and pick up where we left off in our last class and discuss the overall uh, view here or the overview of the events in skeletal muscle contraction. So some of this, the concepts involved in the skeletal muscle contraction um, will be similar to some of the physiological events uh, that we learned in chapter 12 when we were talking about our nervous tissue. So we're gonna see that there's some of these concepts that are gonna be similar, so it shouldn't be anything that's gonna to be too overwhelming for you. So that being said, all right, when we're talking about all the events, we break it down into three major events. We have the excitation of the skeletal muscle fiber, that's gonna occur at the neuromuscular junction. Following that, we have what's called excitation contraction coupling, and this is going to include like an action potential traveling down the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of our muscle cell, and then going into the T tubules and releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So those events occur in excitation contraction, contraction coupling. And then the final step will be the actual cross bridge cycling. This occurs in the sarcomere, in those myofibrils. And so we'll talk about what happens, right, when uh, we start to contract the muscle as the muscle shortens or lengthens. Okay, so we're going to talk about all those exciting different steps here. So let's start off by going over some of the components, because the first step is going to be, all right, here, the excitation of the skeletal muscle fiber. And that's going to occur at what we call the neuromuscular junction. That's where the motor neuron is going to make contact with the muscle fiber. Uh, and we're gonna talk about, we know kind of a little bit of what goes on there because we addressed it in chapter 12, but now we're gonna kind of see how that pertains to skeletal muscle tissue. All right, so what is a, a neuromuscular junction? Well, if you look at the name neuromuscular, it's gonna include a nerve and a muscle and then the space in between. So it's gonna include the synaptic knob of our motor neuron, and then it's also going to include the muscle, but what we call the motor end plate. And that's this area on the muscle fiber in which the synaptic knob comes in really close contact with. And then there's the space in between, which is the synaptic cleft. So these neuromuscular junctions are usually going to be in the middle area of the muscle fiber. So quick review. What is the synaptic knob? Okay, that is the last segment of our neuron. We refer to it as the transmissive segment. And this is where the synaptic vesicles reside. And those synaptic vesicles are those little pouches or those membrane sacs that will hold the neurotransmitter. So now we can actually talk about a named neurotransmitter called acetyl acetylcholine. And when we're talking about its um, innervation of skeletal muscle fibers, acetylcholine is going to be an excitable or an excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. It's going to stimulate and excite our muscle tissue. So in our synaptic knob, we have our calcium ion pumps, and they're constantly pumping calcium out of the synaptic knob. They're creating that calcium gradient, meaning more calcium outside than inside. So that means that when calcium can uh, move across the plasma membrane, it's going to enter into the cell. And then also we know that it has the voltage gated calcium channels. So when that action potential comes down the neuron, it triggers the opening of these voltage gated calcium channels and then calcium can flow down its concentration gradient into our cell. So that's what we see here. Okay, so the same story. We have our active potential, our nerve signal coming down. It opens up those voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium then enters into the synaptic knob, binds onto the synaptic vesicles, and gives the synaptic vesicles an overall positive charge. That positive charge will move those positively charged synaptic vesicles towards the plasma membrane near the synaptic cleft. Then we're going to release our neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And we do that through the process of exocytosis. The synaptic vesicles will merge with the plasma membrane, fuse with it, and then release 
the, of an acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. Roughly about 300 vesicles will release acetylcholine into our synaptic uh, cleft there. On the other side of that synaptic cleft is what we refer to as the motor end plate. This is just an area of the sarcolemma, and it's not flat like you would normally see. It has these folds here, and in those folds, we have our ion channels there. And so in those areas, we have our acetylcholine receptors, which are these protein channels in which acetylcholine will bind onto and open up those protein channels, those uh, chemical gated channels, and it will allow all right, the movement of sodium and potassium across the plasma membrane. In this case, same type of uh, phenomena will occur in which sodium will enter the cell and potassium will exit the cell. We saw that same thing occur right in the neuron. When those channels opened up, sodium would flow in and, cal and potassium would exit out. That is that banana floating in the ocean. All right, so once all that occurs, all right, and we're done. We have to clean up the party. That's where the synaptic cleft comes into play. Yes, it is a fluid-filled space. It allows for the diffusion of these ions across the synaptic cleft and neurotransmitter, All right, But we have our acetylcholine esterase there. And so what this enzyme will do, and I'll talk more about this later on, is that that enzyme will come in and it breaks down the acetylcholine molecules that are just kind of milling around in the synaptic cleft, but also it'll break down the acetylcholine that's on those receptors too. It breaks it down into acetate and choline, and then the, um, the, the neuron can reuptake that and package them back up together inside the cell to make acetylcholine again. So this picture here is a great picture, I love it. It shows you all the events happening. Okay, here's our calcium, excuse me, our calcium ion pumps. And so they're pumping calcium out of the cell. So we have a larger, we have a larger um, a concentration outside the cell. So we have our concentration gradient. So our after potential comes down, stimulates the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium diffuses down its concentration gradient, moves in, binds on to the synaptic vesicles, causes those synaptic vesicles to have a positive charge. They'll migrate towards the negativity on the inside of our plasma membrane. The synaptic vesicles will fuse with the plasma membrane and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft through the process of exocytosis. All right, our synaptic cleft is fluid filled, so these molecules can diffuse nicely across. And then, all right, acetylcholine will bind onto these chemically gated ion channels, triggering the opening of these gates and allowing sodium to flow into the cell and potassium to flow out of the cell. And we're gonna talk about that phenomena uh, as to what goes on. So the area here where you're going to see, all right, where our neuron, our motor neuron, all right, kind of hovers above the muscle fiber, that is called the motor end plate. It's not nice and smooth or flat, it's gonna have these folds. So that's how you're able to discern that from the other areas of our uh, muscle cell, okay? All right, so this picture here, I'll tell you, this is what, figure 1010? If you can memorize this picture and somewhat understand it, you'll, and then kind of go back and look at what I just explained to you in, in more detail, uh, this is the basics, the bare bone basics here. So you, here you can see, here's our motor end plate. And we have all of our chemically gated ion channels down here, all right? So they have the acetylcholine receptor. So our goal is to get acetylcholine out of our motor neuron across the synaptic cleft and for it to bind onto those chemically gated channels there so we can have the diffusion of sodium into, this, into the mo, uh, muscle cell and potassium diffusing out. And so, like I said, this is a good uh, figure to kind of learn the, the basics here. It does a really good job kind of displaying that. So that brings me to the condition called myasthenia gravis. This is an autoimmune disease. So therefore most likely it's gonna affect women, right? More, more than anybody, 
But in this situation, you've developed antibodies, right? Through no fault of your own, but you've developed antibodies that are now going to bind on to those same acetylcholine receptors that we see in the neuromuscular junctions there. And so what will happen is those receptors go bye-bye. We get rid of them. The antibodies attack them, destroy them, because antibodies are proteins, but so are these receptors, right? So you have one group of proteins destroying another group of proteins. And so what happens is now you have fewer receptors, therefore you have fewer channels that can operate for the diffusion of sodium and potassium. And so what happens is we've actually caused a reduction in our ability to stimulate our muscle. So uh, sim um, symptomatically, the patient will present uh, with fatigue, rapid onset fatigue. So if you ask them to um, just kind of jog in place, you don't have to do anything that, uh, that strenuous. But if you ask them maybe to um, do a couple squats, They'll start to fatigue after the first few. They'll exhibit muscle weakness. We usually see all right, the fatigue and the muscle weakness in smaller muscle groups first. So eye and facial muscles you'll see most often. And then we'll move through the larger muscle groups, like some of our larger muscle groups for swallowing. And then especially when we get into the limbs, right, they might have difficulty walking or difficulty doing certain physical activities. Okay? You certainly wouldn't ask these people, all right, to go ahead and um, do uh, squats or anything like that with 500 pounds on their back, that would not be good. There are drugs, all right, that will actually uh, uh, help with this condition. And what they do is they'll go after acetylcholine esterase, um, it, that enzyme there, they'll block, they'll inhibit acetylcholine esterase so it doesn't break down the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. By doing so, all right, the, the acetylcholine will stay in the synaptic cleft and stimulate the existing uh, uh, channels to open and cause a stimulation here. I read somewhere that acetylcholine is linked to Lewy body dementia. Yeah, you know, Lewy body dementia, uh, it's interesting you say that because Lewy bodies are, are protein uh, deposits there in, in, the, in the brain there. And that is one of those theories there. Believe it or not, we've kind of moved away from some of the, uh, uh, the um, Lewy body, especially when it comes to Alzheimer's. Um, there, there's, there's some new developments with Alzheimer's, nothing really that we can make any uh, bold predictions or statements on. Um, but I remember when I was in med school, which was close to 20 years ago, uh, we talked quite a bit about Lewy body. And yeah, acetylcholine, um, there is, there is a, um, a relation there, but we're still, uh, um, we're still researching that. All right, question for you. What triggers the binding of synaptic vesicles to the synaptic knob membrane to cause exocytosis of acetylcholine, all right? So here's what happens. Our active potential, our nerve signal is gonna travel down, all right, to the transmissive end, to the synaptic knob there, and it's gonna stimulate those voltage-gated calcium channels to open up. Calcium enters into the cell, binds onto the synaptic vesicles, and triggers exocytosis of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. <clears throat> all right, so, before we move on to the other two steps of muscle stimulation, I want to first describe to you what a skeletal muscle fiber is doing when it is considered at rest, when it's not doing anything. Because now, if you understand what it's doing at rest, then you'll understand the changes that we've made to it when it's time to um, uh, trigger a muscle contraction. So much like we talked about in chapter 12, how a neuron at rest, what's going on, right? Let's discuss what happens to a skeletal muscle fiber. Well, if you recall, our resting membrane potential in a neuron, all right, remember what that is. Uh, let's just, let me just test your, uh, your memory, see how well you folks have been studying. Does anyone recall what the voltage value is for the resting membrane potential in a neuron? All right, the resting membrane potential in a muscle cell is negative 90. Does anyone, and it, 
um, more than one person can respond, <laughs> okay? All right, the negative resting, excuse me, the resting membrane potential of our skeletal muscle fiber at rest is negative 90. In the neuron, it is, I guess only one person is going, yes, that's right, Victoria, it's negative 70 millivolts. Negative 70 millivolts in the neuron, negative 90 in our muscle cell. Now, this is established the same way that we established the resting membrane potential in a neuron, okay? Remember, we have our leak channels, okay? So sodium and potassium are leaking in and out of the cell all the time, 24 seven. And then we have our sodium and potassium ion pumps, which are going to be trying to uh, help to establish the concentration gradient of those molecules. Oh, well, perfect then. See, I'm glad I was able to answer your question, Victoria. Yeah, so again, a concept that you should already know, right? So all the voltage-gated channels in a skeletal muscle fiber at rest are closed, okay? We haven't established a stimulus yet to open them up. So when the skeletal muscle fiber is at rest, okay, the leak channels are always open, okay? So sodium and potassium are diffusing across the plasma membrane, and then the sodium potassium ion pumps are helping to establish that concentration gradient so those molecules can diffuse through the leak channels there. But keep in mind, the voltage gated channels are closed. So that's what's going on in our resting membrane potential, all right, of the skeletal muscle fiber at rest. That is negative 90 millivolts. There is a threshold value, which we'll talk about here in a moment. All right, so the second step to us getting a muscle to contract is what we call excitation contraction coupling. So now we've got to get a signal, right, from this point here, from our neuromuscular junction to one of our T tubules over here. And T tubules are scattered everywhere. So we've got it, it's like basically throwing a rock into a pond and this big ripple wave is going out in all directions. That's what's going to happen when we eventually uh, create our action potential. So in this, um, in this step here, we're going to see the generation of what we call an EPP or end plate potential, similar, not the same, but similar to a graded potential that we saw in our neurons there, All right? Then we will get what we call a muscle action potential. And then finally, our goal is to release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. I know it's been a week, but the last uh, session that we, we were talking about, I said I was describing calcium like that princess that's held captive in the tower. The sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisterna are going to be that tower and the calcium is gonna be the princess. We need to get calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasm is where our contractile proteins, actin and myosin, right? Thick and thin filaments are located. Okay, so they're in a completely different area, uh, chamber. Okay, calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is outside of the sarcoplasm. Okay, so all these steps here, I'm gonna go through all these steps with you folks. All right, we just went through what happened here. So now, all right, we're gonna talk about as um, sodium and potassium is diffusing across the sarcolemma, what's happening? Well, actually, you probably already know what's going on. You can figure it out, all right? So as sodium enters into the cell and potassium exits the cell, okay, we are going to make the inside of the cell more positive or less negative. We call that depolarization. So what we need to do is get to our threshold value. Our threshold value is negative 65 millivolts. In our neuron, our threshold value was negative 55. In the muscle, all right, it is negative 65. Once we get to that threshold value, and if we can find a voltage-gated channel then we can stimulate the opening up of that channel and we can generate an action potential. Okay, but we're going to, we'll talk about that in a moment. So we need enough sodium, 
to diffuse right into the cell to bring our resting membrane potential of negative 90 to our threshold value of negative 65. And this needs to happen here, all right, at our voltage gated sodium channel. <clears throat> Hold on one second. All right, so let's go on. I'll go through those steps here, but let's start off here and talk about, well, before I forget, because I'm running away. Once that occurs, quick overview here. Once we've generated that action potential, the same phenomena that we discussed, okay, in the neuron in chapter 12 will happen here. We'll depolarize the cell first. And that means that the voltage gated sodium channels will open up. Sodium will rapidly move into the cell. The cell will depolarize. The inside of the cell will go from that negative 90 millivolt resting value to positive 30 millivolts. When that happens, the voltage gated sodium channels close down and then our voltage gated potassium channels will open up. Then it's time to repolarize the cell. So potassium right, will leave the inside of the cell, making the inside of the cell more negative and will repolarize the cell, getting back to that negative 90 millivolt value so we can get back to our um, resting membrane potential. And this will happen all across the sarcolemma, lemma. And these action potentials will go down into the T-tubules and they'll trigger the activation of the voltage sensitive calcium channels. So that change in the membrane potential, that depolarization will trigger these voltage sensitive calcium channels to, to trigger the opening of our calcium release channels. And these calcium release channels are located along the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what we'll see is they'll open up, calcium leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum and moves into the sarcoplasm. And in the sarcoplasm is where our sarcomeres are, our contractile proteins, our thick and thin filaments. Remember, we talked about those. We talked about actin and myosin. And don't forget about our regulatory proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. You see, we need the calcium to bind to the troponin and tropomyosin complex to move tropomyosin off of actin's myosin binding sites. I'll talk about that here. All right, I'm going to show you all that fun stuff. So here you can see it in a little bit more of a zoomed in detail here. That's our goal for the last part of this excitation contraction here where we're going to get that action potential coming down and then triggering the opening of these calcium release channels so we can get calcium to move into the sarcoplasm. All right, so let me just talk about end plate potential here briefly, All right? Again, I compare it, it's similar, I'm not saying it's the same, but it's similar to a graded potential. Okay, graded potentials utilize chemical gated channels. Well. Uh, EPPs, end plate potentials, same thing, right? Those acetylcholine receptors are located on the chemically gated ion channels. And once, once the acetylcholine binds onto them, those channels will open up. Sodium will then diffuse into the cell, right? Potassium will diffuse out, but there's so much more sodium moving into the cell, the potassium leaving, we're still able to depolarize the cell. So we'll see. All right, the membrane potential becomes less negative. Kind of what we saw with an EPSP, the excitatory postsynaptic all right, potential there, okay? So that's what, we'll, we'll see something like that, but instead, all right, we call it an end plate potential. So we've made, all right, the cell membrane less negative. Right? But unfortunately, this is not an act potential, it's an end plate potential and it's local. Right, so it won't go very far. We need it to be strong enough and go just far enough to where it can locate a voltage-gated ion channel and trigger its opening. That's what we need. Right? But the nice thing is we can stimulate this almost immediately after we do it one time.
So that's the nice thing about it. So we can keep releasing acetylcholine and we can keep trying to get all right, our membrane potential to that threshold value. All right, so here's what happens when we eventually do get to that threshold value. Now we're going to generate an action potential. Okay, so our action potential starts off with depolarization. All right, that's when we're going to see a rapid rise in the membrane potential. We'll make it more positive. And then we immediately follow that up with repolarization in which we'll see a fall in the charge of the membrane. So again, like I said, we just need that EPP to be strong enough and make it to a nearby voltage-gated sodium channel. Once when that happens, bam, we trigger the opening of that uh, gate. Sodium will rapidly diffuse into the cell and will cause depolarization. And once that val the, um, we get to the positive 30 millivolt value, then these voltage-gated sodium channels will close. And then we'll start our repolarization process with the opening of the potassium-gated channels. And so potassium can leave the cell and we can decrease our membrane potential. So again, this is like that same process that we learned in chapter 12, dominoes falling. All right, all these adjacent voltage-gated sodium channels will trigger the opening of the next one, and that will trigger the opening of its neighboring voltage-gated sodium channel. And it's one big long chain reaction, all right, all the way down along the sarco, the sarco lemma and down into the T-tubules. That's what we're looking for, okay? So the part that follows our depolarization is gonna be repolarization. Once those sodium channels close, the voltage-gated channel, potassium channels will open up, potassium will exit out of the cell and will repolarize the cell and try to get it back to our resting membrane potential of negative 90 millivolts. And repolarization will follow all the way down into the T-tubules. So we do have, all right, a refractory period. We'll talk about that. Um, it's not going to be the same as the neuron, right? But we will have a brief refractory period for our muscle tissue. All right, so here's that picture here, breaking it down for you, okay? I know I've already explained it to you, and so I won't bore you, okay? But I know I keep saying that. Here we go, really zoom in here for you. So here we'll see, all right, we have all this acetylcholine hanging out in the synaptic cleft. They bind onto the receptors. They trigger the opening of those chemically gated channels. Sodium moves into the cell, potassium exits the cell. We start to generate our end plate potential. We go from negative 90 to negative 85, negative 70, but it does us no good unless we can reach that negative 65. When we reach the negative 65 at our first adjacent voltage-gated sodium channel, the channel opens up, sodium enters in. Now we'll depolarize our plasma membrane. And so as volt, excuse me, voltage, as sodium pours in, right, we are going to decrease the charge of the rest of the membrane. We're going to make it more positive. And so that's what we'll see. And then, of course, you know the rest of the story. All right? Once we depolarize the cell, we will repolarize the cell with the opening of our voltage-gated potassium channels. And this travels all the way down into, I'll come right back to that, down to our T-tubules right here. So I love this picture. Here again, figure 1012. If you know and understand all the words in this graph, on this page here, then you will understand uh, how, um, this process, okay? At least get a general overview. It's a real simpic, simpic, excuse me, simple, can't talk tonight, um, concept here. Here's our negative 65 threshold value. Here's our resting membrane potential in our muscle cell. It's doing nothing. So then, all right, what we'll see is, here in the second stage here, 
and our neuromuscular junction, our motor neuron starts to release our, our, our uh, acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And so it starts to create those EPPs. We start to make some changes in our membrane potential. And we start to make the inside of the cell more positive. If we get to negative 65 at an adjacent voltage gated sodium channel, then it's game on. Once we open one, we've caused depolarization and it's the dominoes start to fall. The cell depolarizes momentarily, gets to that positive 30 value. The voltage gated sodium channels close, our voltage gated potassium channels open, and then uh, uh, potassium moves out of the cell, causing the inside of the cell to become more negative, and we repolarize the cell, trying to get our membrane potential back to that resting membrane potential value of negative 90. If we overshoot it, no problem. We still have our sodium potassium ion pumps that will get us back to our normal uh, resting membrane potential, unless we're going to stimulate the muscle again. So we've made our action potential. It's traveling along the sarcolemma, looking for T tubules to go down into. It's not going to be just one. It could be many. Okay, it could be tens. It could be a hundred. All right. So that action potential is spreading out across the sarcolemma, and it's going to go down into the T tubules, and it will trigger the opening, all right, or the activation of our voltage sensitive calcium channels which will then trigger the opening of our calcium release channels. And so calcium will then diffuse out of our sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisterna. Where does it go? It goes into the sarcoplasm. And so the calcium, this is a very important concept here. It is going to interact with the myofilaments and trigger a contraction. So if you don't have calcium anywhere in your body, you can't have a muscle contraction. Can't do it. Can't do it. You need calcium. You need a couple other things too. You need ATP, which we'll talk about here in a moment. All right. But if you don't have calcium, you can't get a muscle contraction. So if you are hypo, all right, calcemic, that means you have low blood calcium. If you have low calcium in your blood, most likely you have low calcium in your tissues elsewhere. Right? You're going to have problems depending on how bad the deficiency is with muscle contraction. And you're going to find out why here in a moment. Right? Again, here's that picture of that action potential moving on down the sarcolemma. Okay, so we have it moving down. It's going to travel down a T-tubule, trigger the activation of the voltage sensitive calcium channels, which will then trigger the opening of our calcium release channels. Then calcium leaves the sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisterna and pours into the sarcoplasm, where our contractile filaments are waiting. So what two events are linked in the physiologic process called excitation contraction coupling? Okay, well, the two events that are, are going to be triggered are going to be the muscle stimulation at the neuromuscular junction, that first step, and then what we're about to get into now, which is the cross-bridge cycling, the events of contraction caused by the sliding myofilaments, which is the cross-bridge cycling that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Okay, those are the two events. This is the middle step. All right. Cross bridge cycling, folks. This is good stuff. Very, very good. Um, one of the things I would mention to you, if you have not watched that video, it was a four minute and 25 second video that I sent out last week. Please watch it. And all of this that I have just talked about and what I'm about to talk about will make a lot more sense to you. And what I would do is play it a couple times, pause it. If you're not quite sure, go back in through your notes or through this video here and go over that information and then play the video again. I'm telling you, it will help you out. All right. So the third step 
of muscle contraction all right, is going to be our cross bridge cycling. Before we can have that cross bridge cycling, we need calcium to bind onto troponin. Remember we had two proteins, we call them regulatory proteins, know that term. Tropomyosin is the rope protein here. And then the troponin is this globular like protein that has a binding site, a little cup here for calcium. And the troponin sits right on top of the tropomyosin. So in resting skeletal muscle tissue, these myosin binding sites are covered with the rope. Okay, so our goal is to get calcium to these regulatory proteins. So when calcium sits on that regulatory protein, it's going to cause what we call a conformational shape change, and it'll cause the uh, tropomyosin, the rope protein, to shift off the myosin binding sites. So now they're exposed, which is good because myosin down here wants to connect to these sites. And that's what our cross bridge is going to be. Okay, so in order to start that off, we need to have calcium come in, bind to the troponin, and then that is going to then expose actin's myosin binding sites. So that's what we're seeing here. Here's our sarcomere down here. Nice relaxed sarcomere, nothing's going on, okay? Calcium now starts to come in and just cover this whole sarcomere with calcium molecules. And what we're then going to see is that troponin tropomyosin complex moves. And then we can have our cross bridge cycling, which leads me all right, into a cross bridge cycling. So keep that in mind. This slide is just basically telling you just what I said. Calcium, you need to know which protein calcium binds to. It binds to troponin. And so that creates a change in the shape of these molecules, and then it triggers the movement of the tropo, troponin tropomyosin complex off of the myosin binding sites. So now they're exposed. Now we can get to this, our cross bridge cycling. So we're going to talk about our cross bridge cycling right now. There's four steps, and they will repeat as long as you need a contraction to occur for. Once it's time to stop contracting, the muscle has to go into relaxation, then we're not going to be doing these steps anymore. So I'm gonna go, you know me, I'm gonna start off with one step and then I'm gonna show you a picture and then we'll advance on to the second step. So the first step is what we call cross bridge formation. We are going to create a connection between our myosin and our actin. So before this even occurs, our myosin heads, those little globular structures, these fellas right here, all right, they're in what we call the cocked position. Like if you were to use um, a gun and pull the hammer back, like you would see in those um, revolvers in, in, the, uh, in Westerns, they pull the hammer back. And that's the thing that will come forward and strike the bullet uh, and cause the gun to fire. Well, that's what these, uh, the myosin heads, they're cocked in the ready position, okay? So now what we need to do is we need to extend that myosin head, all right, uh, towards the actin so we can get a connection between them. And that's what happens in this first step here. So we'll zoom in, I'll show you a quick picture. All right, here's our, our relaxed sarcomere. Here's our first step. So we see that calcium comes in, all right, it moves the regulatory proteins off the binding sites. So now our myosin can bind onto the actin. So that's what happens here. And now if you'll notice, your myosin head, and I know it's been a week, uh, I told you when we were learning about these proteins that myosin has two binding sites. One binding site is for actin. The other binding site is for ATP. More on that in a few moments. But at this point, when we go through cross bridge formation, we no longer have an ATP molecule attached to the myosin. Instead, we have 
one ADP molecule and one inorganic phosphate molecule. They're attached onto the, the actin binding site here. Okay, so what has happened is myosin is crossed over, it's contacted the actin, and that's our first step. We have now created a cross bridge. So the second step is going to be the power stroke. This is where we're actually going to see movement of the thin filament past the thick filament. This is where you're going to actually see, all right, if I'm looking at you all right, and you're starting to bend your elbow, this is what's the power stroke phase, okay? So what we're going to see is that myosin head is going to swivel. And as it does so, it's going to pull the thin filament all right, past the thick filament, always towards the center of the sarcomere when we're talking about a muscle contraction that's concentric. As this occurs, you remember that ADP molecule and the inorganic phosphate molecule that I told you that was attached to the myosin head? That pops off. So that means that that myosin head can now bind another ATP molecule. This is a reason why you need ATP. I'll, I'll explain it in a moment. You also need ATP, all right, for muscle contractions. You're going to see why here in a, in a few seconds. All right, so here's the power stroke phase, the second phase or step. Okay, so here you can see the myosin head is in the cock position. And what it's going to do is it's going to pull the actin, because it's attached to it, past itself towards the center of the sarcomere, all right, the M line. As that happens, that inorganic phosphate molecule and the ADP molecule pop off the myosin head. So you have a binding site available for ATP. Now you're going to find out the importance of ATP, why you need it. That brings us to the third step. Right. Well, we need to disengage that myosin head in case we want to do another contraction or in case we want to relax the muscle. So in order to release the myosin head, we need ATP to bind on to that myosin head. When that happens, myosin pops off the actin. That's why. So rigor mortis is a condition that we see in dead people soon after death. It doesn't stay forever, okay? That's a misconception, right? But it will happen for a short period of time. When you're dead, you're not making ATP anymore. And so if you're not making ATP, we can't release the myosin head from those cross bridges. So therefore the muscles are engaged, they're stiff. Over time though, those proteins will degenerate and degrade, and then the cross bridges will just start to break apart, and then the muscles relax. That's why, all right, um, rigor mortis does not last for, forever. All right, so the third step, that's the release of the head right here. Okay, so we see, all right, act, not actin, okay? Myosin is still attached. We'll go to the power stroke here. Myosin is still attached. It's got a free binding site now for ATP. ATP comes onto the myosin head, binds to it, and that gives us the energy to pull the myosin head away from the actin. So we're able to disengage. So like I said, either we can do another contraction or we can relax. So that brings us to the last step, which is to reset our myosin head. We gotta move it back into that cock position. So this involves ATP again. Okay, so that ATP that is sitting on that um, ATP binding site on the myosin head is going to then, all right, get broken down by the enzyme ATPase. This enzyme is going to break down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That process is going to give us the energy to cock the head back again. So now you're ready for another cross bridge if you need be, 
or just to have the muscle relax. So that's what we're seeing in the last step here. Okay, so in order for us to go from the relaxed position to the cock position, we're gonna break down that ATP into ADP and interganic phosphate. And we've recocked all right, that myosin head. And we can start the whole process over again. All right, so this is a lot of stuff that happens quickly. All right, huge important concept. As long as we have calcium and ATP, you can have cross bridge cycling. That's something that you need to know. So any condition that can cause deficiency in calcium or deficiency in ATP. Well, I could give you one, say you don't have enough phosphate in your body. Well, phosphate's important because ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So if you don't have phosphate available, you can't make ATP. All right, so when we are undergoing cross bridge cycling, we are going to see the sarcomere shorten. Well, either end of the sarcomere are the Z discs. In case you don't remember, those are the structures here. That's where the actin is going to be anchored to. The M line is in the middle right here. That's the M line. That's where the myosin, easy to remember, M line myosin, myosin is anchored to the M line. So a sarcomere is from one Z disc here to the other Z disc here. So when we contract, you can see how it's shortened. Okay, so you'll see the narrowing or the disappearance of the H zone and the I band. The I band is the area of our sarcomere, if you recall, where only actin is going to be present. Right. The H zone we'll see is where the myosin is present. And so we'll get some overlapping in those zones as you're contracting will become smaller and smaller and smaller. And in some cases during ma uh, maximal muscle contraction, they can completely disappear. Last but not least, keep in mind, we never change the length of actin and myosin. They just slide by each other. They don't get shorter, they don't get longer. Okay, that's another, that's people can get easily fooled on tests when that is addressed. So keep in mind, thick and thin filaments, actin and myosin filaments never change length. They always stay the same length. So here's a nice picture. Okay, what you can see here all right, of a relaxed muscle and a contracted muscle. So here's our nice relaxed muscle. All right, we got a little bit of overlap between the thick and thin filaments. Here's our M line, here's our Z disc. Okay, our I band is just where there is thin filaments only. Okay, and our H zone is where there's only thick filaments only. We'll see overlapping in the A band here. Okay, so. Now we start to contract the muscle. So we're going to pull the thin filaments past the thick filaments. The thin filaments are gonna to move towards the center, towards the M line. So you can see as we're contracting our muscle, right now we're seeing a lot of overlap and we're seeing those thin filaments move towards the center past the uh, myosin there, okay? So in this case, we have a maximally contracted biceps brachii muscle. And so we have completely gotten rid of our I band and our H zone. They're completely gone because there is overlapping of both thick and thin filaments there. So what is the function of calcium in skeletal muscle contraction? Ooh, yeah. Function of calcium. Well, here it is. Calcium is going to be all right, that molecule that is going to um, bind to the troponin regulatory protein. And when that happens, it's gonna change the shape and cause, all right, the troponin tropomyosin complex to move off of the myosin binding sites that are found on the actin molecule. 
That's what we're going to see here. And then that is going to then start our cross bridge cycle. You should know that. Make sure you know that. One of the things I recommend after this class is to immediately watch that four minute video that I could not successfully play on here. I'm gonna to have to mess around with that. It's a great video. What causes the release of the myosin head from actin and what resets the myosin head? Okay, so the first one is ATP, okay? ATP is going to allow once ATP binds onto the myosin head, one of the uh, binding sites there, it's gonna allow myosin to release from actin. Then we need to reset this thing. All right, so we can do another cross bridge cycle. As we do that, the enzyme ATPase is going to break down ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That's what that little I means. All right, and so that allows us to reset the head, but at the cost of breaking down ATP. And basically what we're doing is we're just snapping off, right, the last phosphate molecule off of the ATP molecule, but it's the bond that holds it on there is a high energy bond. So when we snap that bond, it gives us enough energy to reset, all right, the myosin head. All right, one of my favorite things to talk about are neurotoxins. And um, so I'd like to talk about both tetanus and botulism. All right, we've talked about this a little bit briefly, All right? Tetanus here is one of those things that you can pick up if you're walking around barefoot somewhere and you step on a rusty nail or something rusty because Clostridium tetani is going to be a pathogen that loves to sit on rusty things. So basically what this pathogen will do is it will produce a toxin that causes spastic paralysis. Now there's different types of paralysis, okay? A lot of times people think if you're having a paralysis, you can't move your muscles. But we have spastic paralysis and what we call muscular paralysis. So basically spastic paralysis is when the muscles contract so much Right? They, they, they can't move. So yeah, you're, you are getting a paralysis because the muscles can't move. In this case, our muscles can't move because what we've done is, right, we are not, uh, we've um, blocked the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if you're blocking the release of an inhibitory neurotransmitter, the only thing that's available then that's being released all right, on our end organs, the muscles, is going to be an excitatory neurotransmitter. So we cannot stop that, uh, um, the muscles from contracting. So, of course, good way to prevent this, get vaccinated. All right, most likely, if you, if you come in contact with something that's rusty, and if, you haven't, and if you're not sure of your vaccination schedule, they'll most likely give you... Um, the uh, tetanus uh, uh, vaccination in the hospital, if they're concerned, because you don't want tetanus. It'll mess you up. It can cause horribly painful muscle contractions. Uh, it can be really, really severe lockjaw, for example. Um, the tetanus toxin loves the masseter muscle. All right, the other type of muscle paralysis is going to be botulism. Now we're all familiar with botulism because of Botox. So in this case, all right, we're gonna see a muscular paralysis in which is another way to call that is flaccid paralysis. All right, so C botulinum or Clostridium botulinum makes this toxin that will cause the muscles to go flaccid. And the, re the reason for this is because at our motor neuron, we are not releasing our neurotransmitter. So botulism will prevent the release of the acetylcholine from the synaptic knobs. Well, if we're, we're, we're stopping our muscle contraction process way early in the game, right? Way back at step one at the neuromuscular junction. So if we can't release the acetylcholine, we'll never be able to generate an EPP or an AP uh, or an extra potential. We never can get calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this can be life-threatening, but also we use it all the time for muscle specificity, right? If a muscle's in spasm really bad, 
Uh, if you have uh, cervical genic torticollis and you get this really bad muscle spasm, uh, um, Botox is great, right? Also, people will use it for, yes, cosmetic purposes to help remove uh, wrinkles or flatten out uh, certain muscles that might be um, uh, contracting too much and causing uh, more wrinkles. All righty. So that and everything that I've talked about so far tonight is our muscle contraction. I do want to talk about muscle relaxation. And if you have a pretty decent understanding of muscle contraction, then muscle relaxation will make sense to you because a lot of it is um, kind of everything. I won't say everything's in reverse, but certain steps kind of go in reverse. So for example, all right, I want to stop my muscle from contraction. How about if I take out the, the uh, nervous system part of that? What do I do? I stop producing a nerve signal. If I'm not producing my action potential in my neuron, I cannot release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. All right, so this is one of the ways that we get a muscle to relax. Stop with the action potentials, no more nerve signals, no more acetylcholine being released from the motor neuron, okay? But still, I've already released some acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, no problem. My cleanup crew is there, acetylcholine esterase. My cleanup crew enzyme is going to break down acetylcholine into acetate and choline. Then we'll recycle it back in the neuron there, okay? So we're going to get rid of any acetylcholine that's out in the cleft. And what we'll see is, right, if we get rid of all the acetylcholine, we will not be able to trigger those chemically gated channels in our motor uh, end plate there. So we cannot produce an EPP. If we're not producing an EPP, we can't make it to that threshold value. We are not going to produce an action potential. If we're not producing an action potential, then we cannot trigger the opening of those voltage sensitive calcium channels to open up those calcium releasing channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So all of those close down. So we're no longer gonna have open calcium channels. So calcium is no longer leaking in or moving into the sarcoplasm. So any calcium that's in the sarcoplasm is gonna get returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum by our calcium ion pumps. And if, once that occurs, if there's no calcium in the sarcoplasm, then troponin goes back to its normal shape and it's gonna move tropomyosin over actins, myosin binding sites. And then the muscle will go back to its original length and position because of connectin because of that elasticity that it gets from the connecting protein. So that's skeletal muscle relaxation. How do acetylcholine esterase and calcium ion pumps function in the relaxation of muscle? There you go, okay? Acetylcholine, is gonna cl acetylcholine esterase is gonna clean up the mass in the synaptic cleft, and it'll also, all right, get rid of any acetylcholine that's on the receptors there. Then once it's off the receptors, those chemically gated channels close. So no more diffusion of sodium and potassium across the plasma membrane. And then of course our calcium ion pumps are just gonna return calcium back to the tower, right? They've captured the princess. They said, all right, you're going back in the tower. We're getting you out of the sarcoplasm and back into our sarcoplasmic reticulum. So our regulatory proteins can block all right, uh, actins, myosin binding site. All right, um, I've got some more time here, so I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit here about the skeletal muscle metabolism. I know I've mentioned this a little bit before in one of the other videos that I sent out, but um, let's talk a little bit about skeletal muscle metabolism. Now, normally, your skeletal muscles have enough ATP on hand in the cytoplasm for about five seconds of exertion. Not a lot, but not too bad. So we've got to have right, more energy. 
we need more cowbell, right? So our energy that, that we need is ATP. So where can we get it from? Well, one of the ways that we can get ATP is to take two ADP molecules. And we're gonna take a phosphate off of one of those ADP molecules and stick it on to another ADP molecule. And that will make ATP as evidenced in this picture, okay? Here's our two ADP molecules. And so we're just gonna take this phosphate, pluck it off and stick it on to this molecule here, which gives us ATP. So we need an enzyme to do that. That enzyme is called myokinase. I've said this before. Kinase is an enzyme that likes to take phosphate and put it onto something. We call that phosphorylization. And so that's what myokinase does. It phosphorylates ADP, okay? Now, all right, our body or our muscle cells, all right, have three other ways to generate ATP. We have a special molecule called creatine phosphate. All right, then we have the process of glycolysis, which is the breaking down of glucose inside of our cell in the cytoplasm. And then we have aerobic cellular respiration in which you have to have two things at minimum, all right? You need to have oxygen and you need to have a mitochondria. If you don't have oxygen, well, it doesn't matter. You won't need the mitochondria, but you need to have oxygen and a mitochondria for aerobic cellular respiration. All right, so let's talk about the first process, creatine phosphate. So si similar to what we saw with what happened with myokinase. Now we're just gonna change out one of those ADP molecules for the creatine phosphate molecule. So we have a high energy bond between creatine and its phosphate. So this um, enzyme, creatine kinase, is going to take that phosphate that was attached to the creatine and put it onto an ADP molecule. And then you know the rest of that story. It will make an ATP molecule. So we're gonna just cleave this off. We're gonna take this phosphate here, Bye, creatine, you don't need that anymore. We're gonna put it over here onto our ADP molecule, and that's gonna give us ATP. And here is the enzyme that does that, creatine kinase. Pretty nice, that's good, right? This is good for about 10 to 15 seconds, but we're gonna burn through that pretty fast, especially if you're running a, a, a marathon. Okay, all right, no problem. Let's try this on for size. How about glycolysis? This is a process that goes on all over the place. All these different cells uh, utilize glycolysis. I'm only gonna talk to you about how it affects uh, the muscle cells here. Glycolysis is an anaerobic respiration process, meaning it does not require oxygen, does not. So we're gonna take one molecule of glucose and we are going to have it undergo glycolysis and we're gonna get some ATP out of it. At the end of glycolysis, we're gonna wind up with two pyruvate molecules. Those pyruvate molecules are intermediate molecules for what we're gonna talk about here in a moment for another process here. All right, so if we have no oxygen, we'll break down glucose in the cytoplasm. I, and that will give us two ATP molecules. That's not bad. It's not very good, but it's not bad. So where does the glucose come from? Two sources, all right? It comes from your bloodstream all the time. Think about it. What's insulin used for? Insulin is gonna be the hormone that's gonna take glucose out of your blood and put it into tissues, okay? So glucose will be in your blood and it'll be in your muscles in the form of glycogen. Remember glycogen um, is the storage form of glucose. Think of it like a pearl necklace. Each pearl is a glucose molecule. So all the cell is gonna do is gonna start cleaving off the pearls off the necklace, and then it'll start breaking down glucose into pyruvate. All right, so now let's say we want to make more energy. 
Okay, now remember we did the first two energy processes. Right? Our creatine kinase was one of the additional ways to make ATP. Glycolysis is uh, an additional way to make ATP. But how about this one? Aerobic cellular respiration. This process here, we need, I told you two things, oxygen and a mitochondria. So we just talked about glycolysis. We have a glucose molecule. We broke it down into two pyruvate molecules. Problem is we only got a two ATP out of that process when we could get so much more. All we needed was oxygen and mitochondria. Well, guess what? We have that now. So we're going to take that pyruvate molecule and we're going to bring it into the mitochondria. The thing is, as long as we have oxygen, we can do that. And I've used this analogy before, all right? Oxygen is like that friend that you have that can get you into the VIP section of a concert or a, a sporting event, okay? And the mitochondria is the bouncer, your pyruvate, okay? If you have no oxygen, you're not getting in. If you do have oxygen, then pyruvate is able to get into the mitochondria. It goes through a series of reactions. You don't have to know it for, for right here, right? That's another chapter, right, in 211. But we're going to oxidize that pyruvate and wind up with carbon dioxide. Well, that's pretty cool because guess what? We're going to just exhale that off. But be, this process, we're just basically going to transfer all right, these energies through these, this energy through chemical bonds. And as a result of that, we are going to generate 30 ATP, all right, through the process of oxidative phosphorylation. Right, again, I'm, you don't need to know the details on that. So if I have oxygen, mitochondria, and one molecule of glucose, I can break that down and I can get 30 ATP from that one molecule of glucose, all right, through aerobic cellular respiration. And then I also got two ATP from glycolysis, all right? So that's a total of one molecule of, of glucose will give me 32 ATP. So, we talk about the different fuels. Now, glucose is a great fuel. It's, it's a good energy source, but your body prefers fat, triglycerides. Triglyceride, you recall from chapter two, is a molecule that is made up of a glycerol backbone and three fatty acids. Fatty acids come in different sizes. We have short chain fatty acids, medium chain fatty acids, and long chain fatty acids. The longer the chain, the more energy, the more ATP we can get. So as long as you're aerobically exercising, your body is going to go after these triglycerides, right, and use them as fuel to produce ATP. It is the preferred fuel. And that's what your body loves to do. This picture is awesome. It shows you all of what I just explained to you, right? So you can see here's the phosphogen system, myosin kinase, our creatine kinase. They're working hard on transferring phosphate molecules onto ADP to give us ATP. And then we've got our glycolysis that's going to be breaking down glucose and giving us two ATP molecules. We can get glucose from our blood right here. You can see it in the blood and also inside the cell in the storage form of glycogen. The process of breaking glycogen down into glucose is called glycogenolysis. The last five letters here of that name, lysis means to lyse or break off. So when we're talking about glycogen, we are going to break down glycogen into glucose molecules. And then finally, we have the aerobic cellular respiration model here in which we need oxygen. Where do we get oxygen from? Well, the cell itself will have it attached to myoglobin. It's only found in muscle cells, the myoglobin. But guess what? We also have oxygen in our blood. 
attached to hemoglobin, All right? So you have two sources of oxygen, myoglobin and hemoglobin, but you'll burn through that myoglobin pretty fast. All right, now what happens all right, to that pyruvate, let me show you, here's this molecule here. All right, so you're working out, and at first you were great because you had plenty of oxygen. Man, this workout's going a lot longer. This race is taking me a lot longer to run. I'm running out of oxygen. So you're gonna undergo an anaerobic respiration without oxygen. So your body has created a way in which pyruvate, okay, can be converted into a molecule called lactate. You probably heard of lactic acid. And some of you may have heard that lactic acid can cause muscle soreness, muscle cramping. That's true, okay? Because it'll accumulate in your muscles. Well, guess what? You don't want it in your muscles. We want it elsewhere. Where? We want to get it back into circulation right, to get it to the uh, liver. And I'll talk about that in a second. So here's what happens when we don't have much available oxygen, pyruvate gets converted into lactate, right? Through the process, well, not the process, all right, through the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. So we can use lactate for fuel, right? But we need to ship it out and send it into the blood, right, to get either to the heart or the liver. If it gets to the liver, it can undergo the lactic acid cycle, in which will convert that lactate back into glucose through the process of gluconeogenesis. Gluco is glucose, neo is new, so and, ju and, and genesis is to create or make. So we're going to make new glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. And that's what lactate is. And then we'll send it back to the muscle, the lactic acid cycle. So when we talk about these different ways of supplying energy, some examples I like to use is if you only need it for about 10 seconds, which is about an equivalent of a 50 meter sprint on a track, that's the straightaway, I believe, right? We're primarily going to get all that energy, that ATP from myokinase and creatine kinase. If you're going to go once around the track, right, again, less than a minute, we're going to use that phosphate transfer system, but also will start to use glycolysis. Then after that, all right, if you're gonna do a 15, uh, 100 meter run, that's about, I think that's a mile, okay? Roughly about six minutes. You're gonna use all three systems, all right? But primarily, as long as oxygen is available, you're gonna use, all right, the aerobic cellular respiration process because you'll burn through that other stuff. All right, and then this slide here is just showing you the uh, benefits of exercise, all right, helping to raise your heart rate. It's always good to do that. That will help to increase uh, better uh, breathing and circulation, okay? It helps to move oxygen. You'll learn about that when you do uh, uh, the cardiac in 211, but you get enhanced oxygen delivery so you can get more intense workouts. It's good stuff. All right, here you can see that picture there. All right, additional ATP is made immediately available in muscle tissue through which unique phosphate-containing molecule, creatine phosphate. What are the various means for making ATP available in the 1,500-meter race? All of them, the phosphogen system, aerobic cellular respiration, and anaerobic cellular respiration. All right, I'm going to stop there because it's time to stop.